Well, let's, um, let's, let's ask somebody who was in that position, um, Christine. Um, had the U.S. signed, let's do an, an, an act of imagination. The U.S. had ratified the, the Rome Statute shortly after it came in. It was able to do so. And you're sitting in the office and Luis Moreno Campo says, you know, there's, it's kind of undeniable that this torture happened and I want you to head up the, uh, the investigation into this and to advise me on how we should proceed. Well, I do think there are, yeah, I think there are two, two barriers. One is that it's a court of last resort. So the first thing you would look at is even if, it, even if the U.S. had joined the court, you have this question of whether U.S. Um, the U.S. judicial system is dealing with it itself. And for example, at this time, I think it's, it's you can't really say. I don't think that the ICC would jump in at this moment in time today to say, okay, the U.S. is not going to do anything because that's not what, that's not the state of affairs. So there's great deference to domestic systems. And then secondly, it's true. We actually were asked to review um, the conduct of British soldiers in Iraq at detention facilities, and um, because the UK is a member of the court, and the general allegation was that British soldiers were aiding and abetting American soldiers in engaging in torture, the detention facilities, and there were a number of reasons why um, we declined the investigation, but one of them was that British authorities were already prosecuting their own soldiers and that we would continue to monitor that. And secondly, that this is not the order of magnitude that you have in the Congo or Darfur. I mean, the court is a court with limited resources, so um, you know, whether it's gonna spend its time and resources on cases where there is a robust domestic system, there's prospect of domestic progress, and the crimes, although they're awful, do not have near the reach or the, or the systematicity as the other crimes that the court is investigating, you know, that's going to be a real barrier. I, I think as an American, I'm coming home, I think about this issue very differently. And I always tell people, because I know Americans find fascinating this issue of whether Dick Cheney could be prosecuted by the ICC. You know, that would be a real failure for us as Americans. Okay, our system should be able to deal with that. And, and it's not denying that there's a huge debate that needs to be had. I love it that Congress is thinking of different things, that Eric Holder is put in this position of thinking about what to do next. That's what should happen, because if the ICC ends up with those prosecutions, that's a failure of our system at home. And that shouldn't happen. As you saw, the ICC has much more other things to do. So I don't think, um, as an American, you know, I have every hope and belief that we can find a way to have accountability for crimes that Americans commit. And if we ever reach the day when those cases are viable cases in the ICC, it's going to be the sign of some decay in American judicial system that is far greater than we would ever want. We, we just don't want to be in that position. But, but let me ask you about that, because if Eric Holder was to listen to President Obama uh, and not act independently as the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the United States, then he wouldn't open an investigation, and there wouldn't be prosecutions, and then he would be in the position where the American criminal justice system has failed. And then we would be back in the ICC situation. And then the question would be this question about the scale. And it's clear that if you look at the instances of torture and you put them against the, the, the atrocities in Darfur and Congo, numerically they pale in comparison. But there's something else, it's not just a numeric question, right? Because if you travel around the world, a lot of people say about international justice that it's imbued with this terrible and corrosive double standard, that we focus on the crimes of weak nations committed principally in Africa, and when powerful nations commit crimes, they get off the hook. So isn't there a danger if we apply purely a numerical standard that the even-handedness, the even-handedness, the blindness of justice, which is something we celebrate, is also then lost? I don't really agree with that because I do think you have to have some measure of significance. And even in my job as a, as a U.S. prosecutor, we always apply those standards. I think the real, in Iraq, the issue is more which crimes you've made a part of the statute. The crime that failed to become agreed upon at Rome was aggression. 
And aggression is the mother of all these other crimes, because when you have unjustified war, that's when you're going to have war crimes. That's when you're going to have wide, you know, widespread and systematic crimes against civilians. So in Iraq, the issue is, is not so much in my mind. If you're going to talk about a double standard, I think the real problem with the double standard comes in, in the question of whether or not it was justified for America to go to Iraq in the first place. Um, the, the, it's not, I'm not meaning to minimize at all the issues in the detention centers and all the things that sprung out of that, but I think you have to have a realization that the real problem there is aggression, and that was the crime that was prosecuted at Nuremberg. Um, today, the countries, the, the countries at Rome couldn't agree that that should become part of the Rome Statute today because that's extremely controversial. Of course, America was dead set against making aggression a crime in the Rome Statute, so was Israel. Um, so, but I think as humanity, we're going to be better off if someday, 100 years from now, or 150 years from now, we can agree that aggression really is the crime that breeds all the rest of these crimes. And when you bring that under the tent, you'll have a more even-handed application of, of the rule of law.